Hi, I'm Bob Elias, and I've often thought about doing my first full fall tour. So recently I bought Harvey, my new motorhome, and took off the East Coast. Why don't you come along, we'll show you how the tour went. You may be familiar with the Well, which is a computer bulletin board system in Sausalito, California. Among many other social, political, and technical conferences on the Well, there are six devoted to the Grateful Dead. When I posted my plans to do the fall tour, I was immediately invited to stay with Wellheads on the East Coast. Meeting friends I had only known through my computer screen was enough to throw the decision over the top, and I planned to leave the morning after the last October Shoreline show. I did a rough calculation and decided it would take 190 tapes to go cross country without having to listen to the same show twice. So Harvey and I packed and took off from Mountain View. The Shoreline run was well played, and the last outdoor shows of the season were held in ideal weather conditions. Among other infrequently played tunes, such as Wang Dang Doodle and Jackaro, we were treated to the first Death Don't Have No Mercy since March 21st, 1970. The magic of being on the road had already begun before even leaving the Bay Area, and rumors were flying that a group called formerly the Warlocks were to play two shows in Hampton, Virginia, just before the Meadowlands. Who else could that possibly be? The Hampton shows had no mail order, and ticket sales were restricted to the Coliseum box office and two nearby record stores. It seemed obvious that this was an attempt to limit the onslaught of ticketless fans that brought negative attention to our scene. After a four and a half day drive cross country, it became apparent this plan may have backfired as hundreds appeared looking for tickets. Scalping reportedly went as high as $120. The dead, or warlocks if you will, opened to a sellout crowd on Saturday. The first set held few surprises, but the return of Help on the Way, Slipknot, and Franklin's Tower, and the I Bid You Goodnight Encore set up anticipation for what was to come. This was the first dark star since the July 13, 1984 Greek theater, Full Moon Jam. Though played to a less than packed house, no audience could have been more appreciative. This set also included Death Don't Have No Mercy, and closed with Addicts of My Life, not played since September 27, 1972. As we took off for New Jersey, we wondered, could other old favorites return? Could this continue? On the third night of the Meadowlands, the first set once again ended with Help Slip Frank and the energy from the second set Scarlet Fire Truckin' set expectations high for what might follow. But for me, no expectations could have lived up to the reality of the second set the next night. It felt like the entire set was space, occasionally punctuated by structure and lyrics. This receives my vote as the best set of the decade. Outside the shows, things in New Jersey were different. Some of my new friends removed their license plates in the parking lot to prevent theft. And even though this was to be non-vending, no one made an attempt to stop the dozens of hawkers of trademarked image tie-dyes in the lots after the shows. These were obviously not Grateful Dead merchandising, nor handmade. And outside the shows, we experienced another first, the killing of 19-year-old Adam Katz. I didn't hear of the incident until almost five days later, when I read it on the well. Adam was found alongside the highway near the Meadowlands during the break on October 14th and died the next day. The official autopsy report claims the death as a result of a single blow to the head from a blunt instrument. Needless to say, we were all shocked and perhaps not totally surprised given the attitude we experienced from the staff at the venue. With a day off between shows, several of us decided to travel. Immediately upon arriving at a friend's in Washington, D.C., a special bulletin flashed across the TV screen. Earthquake in San Francisco. Having survived many others over the years, my attention wasn't grabbed until I saw the collapse of the Bay Bridge. Phone lines were downed or overloaded and we couldn't reach the well. 
So we established a link from D.C. to New Jersey to Philadelphia to California where one of us was able to contact family and friends for all of us traveling on the tour. Within four hours, we knew everyone had come through uninjured. In Philadelphia, the shows continued as planned. No one was surprised when the run opened with a very deliberate countdown into Shakedown Street. Tickets were scarce, but expectations high outside the spectrum. Deadhead TV's own Kathleen Arvec was on hand. As we all know, the Dead have pulled out some real relics on this tour. Do you think you're going to be one of the lucky ones to hear Dark Star? They did Meadowlands. We wanted it at the Spectrum. You know, we're, it's not my much to ask. Travel a long way to see these shows, you Where'd know. Where'd you come from? Uh, after Hampton, I laid out for a while, missed most of the Meadowlands, but now I'm here. It's on to Charlotte. They're going to Miami for the next Dark Star, definitely. There's like 74, the U.S. Blues Dark Star in Miami. That's what we're waiting for. The third show and fully produced a surprise. A new song, California Earthquake. We posted this discovery on the well only to find that it was a song by Rodney Crowell. Within 24 hours, lyrics have been posted to the tourist conference. This was to be played only one more time in Charlotte, and this time to open the show. Security at Charlotte displayed vicious attitudes. I was somehow not surprised to hear of busts by tie-dyed police. We traveled on to Miami, where the weather was idyllic. A vending scene was created off of Miami Auditorium property and announced on the local radio. Though crowded, problems seemed few, if any indeed. It seemed strange to be sipping pina coladas at a dead show, but indeed that's what we were to find. The first show was solid, but the last was to give us one more dark star for the road home, and the tour concluded with a killer second set. I had plenty of time to reflect on this adventure, taking two weeks to drive back to California. I had solidified friendships that previously only existed on my computer. I witnessed the return of songs that were almost forgotten. I missed the color, excitement, and camaraderie of the vending scene. And I felt shock at the first tour homicide of one of our own. I couldn't help but wonder as I drove down the road where this long, strange trip would lead next.